have mercy, look okay, at how three, the time two, goes. And welcome everybody to this episode of the Coming Home Podcast so with John Allen. Allen. I am your host, John Allen. And today I have Carissa Reinsburg with me. Good morning. Hello. There you are. Bright and early <laughs> on a on a beautiful, beautiful Norwegian Saturday morning. Yeah, it would be great to get outside and um, take my child for a walk. Hopefully it'll be cool, but I don't know. The forecast seems like it's going to be uh, in the 80s again. I don't know if you switched over to the Celsius system, but I, uh, after being here for five years, I, I still relate to the weather in a Fahrenheit manner. I guess I relate to it in the Celsius uh, manner. It's... Um I can't remember when I went over to that, but it just, it's just easier just to follow the Celsius. That's what they're doing here. And yeah. Yeah. But it, what's funny is what I used to consider cool, you know, like a temperature in the high sixties to me, that's hot. You yeah. Know? When it gets, when it gets above 18 Celsius, which is almost, which is around 70 degrees, that's too hot for me. Yeah. I've been here 18 years and I've just, my, my body has totally changed to, you know, it's totally adapted <laughs> to the Norwegian weather. So these days where it's 80 plus, that's like a major heat wave to me. Yeah, yeah that's too much. Whereas when I lived um, back in the States, 80 degrees was my favorite um, like temperature. I'd love to go outside, yeah, yeah. go for a walk, everything. But, yeah. you know, yeah, I think it's the walking, you know, I don't want to arrive somewhere sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and Norwegians haven't figured out, the Norwegian homemakers, they haven't figured out real air conditioning. You know? Yeah. They have those wall units, and a problem arises when you're trying to spread the cool air throughout the whole house. Like, I'm sitting in my studio right now, just about ready to start sweating. But in the living room, it's fine. We've got our, our so-called air conditioner going, and in the living room in the hallway is fine. But in here, it's hot as heck. Yeah, I feel you. I am just figuring this out with a, my baby is four and a half months old and you know, those babies, they don't like the heat. So we just ordered one of those um, air cooling things after a recommendation from my friend. So okay. hopefully that'll uh, bring some coolness, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole nother level trying to figure that, out, that stuff out here. Definitely. Four months old. I remember those days. <laughs> you are pretty busy then I would imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you know, having kids is a job. Anybody that, th that thinks it's not, they just haven't experienced it themselves. <laughs> it's yeah. a, it's oh, a, yeah. It is a job. Um, I, uh, I can remember, especially when our son was born, because he just didn't sleep. Our daughter was pretty, pretty good. I put good in air quotes because any baby is good. <laughs> But her sleep, her sleep schedule was good. She slept a lot and she was very calm and, and, and she just wasn't fussy. But our son was a handful. Yeah. Never slept. And it was, it, it was, it was like having a second job. Yeah. Sounds a bit like my son. He'll go down for his naps, but um, he'll nap like half hour, 40 <sighs> minutes tops. Now, where are you from in the States? I am from Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah. yeah if I, it's funny. If I speak to another American or another Minnesotan, my accent just pops out just like that. It's, it's fascinating. But then um, I guess it just depends on who I speak with. It's interesting. Well, I just got done watching, I think it was, was it season two of the Fargo series. So, the, oh, so yeah. the, <laughs> the Minnesota, North Dakota thing is very much in my head. I don't know. I'm <laughs> I'm, fa I'm fascinated with accents. You know, as you know, here in Norway, there's an accent pretty much every city block. You come into a, a, new, a, new, uh, a new dialect or a new accent. Yeah. And that kind of made me more aware of the different accents back home. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you Minnesotans definitely have a way of talking. <laughs> yeah, sure. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> I almost snarfed up my water I was drinking when you said that. <laughs> Uh, you betcha, don't you know? <laughs> and then we also say oofta in the same yes, way that Norwegians exactly, do. Exactly. Yep. Well, it's interesting because some of the speech patterns up there in Minnesota are you can just you can match it directly with the speech patterns here in uh, in Norway. Like you know when they say uh, like you betcha or or don't you know, um, that's like how Norwegians at the end of their sentences will put on vettu or shunnedu, which is yeah. basically the same thing. 
you know, mm-hmm. don't you know, or bet you bet, or yeah. It's just it's interesting. The the speech patterns are almost exactly the same from Minnesotans to Norwegians. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe Minnesota has the most Norwegians um, in the U.S. Either yes. there or North Dakota, because the I guess the climate's similar or something. Well, they say they say that there are more people with Norwegian ancestry in Minnesota than there are Norwegians in Norway. <laughs> they do say that. I, I do believe that's true. I mean, it, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. But I think I think that's true. I yeah, I'll tell you this. When I was preparing to move here um, in July of 2015, I was doing a lot of shopping. And as you know, with shopping in the states, they want your email, they want your <laughs> phone number, they want you to sign up for a club. So I finally had a great excuse. I was like, oh, you know, I'm moving to Norway, so I, you know, I don't think we have that store in Europe. Sorry. And they're like, oh my gosh. My great grandmother's Norwegian. Oh my gosh, my great grandfather's Norwegian or Swedish. Yeah, so I, yeah. I can't tell you how many people said that. So yeah, the, the Minnesotans are very proud of their Norwegian heritage. I kind of use that against a friend of ours. Uh, now, my wife was an exchange student. She went to high school in um, in uh, first in New York, but then later in yeah. uh, in Minnesota. I think it was was it Chaska Chaska Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so, and she's still very good friends with those people to this day. And um, this guy, Jerry, now he's an older guy. He married a Norwegian woman who immigrated to the States during World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his, but his parents were born and raised in Norway. He was raised in America. And he's like 80, I don't know, 84, 85 years old now. And he's never managed to learn how to speak Norwegian. What? But I speak fluent Norwegian, so whenever yeah. he comes over here to visit, I always throw it in his face that <laughs> I, the non-Norwegian black guy from Ohio, mm-hmm. I speak fluent Norwegian and you don't. So and, it, and it's just it's just like an extra dig on on his on his Norwegian pride. He's so proud to be Norwegian, but embarrassed that he cannot speak Norwegian. Or he's not Norwegian; he's the son of Norwegians, but uh, that he can't speak Norwegian. I just always rub that in. I'm so ter- oh, yeah. I'm terrible like that. No, you got to use it at any cost. For me, it's uh, kind of a party trick. No one expect, you know, since no. I write everything in English on Facebook and, yeah. you know, really, I guess I speak English most of the time. But, yeah, I speak fluent Norwegian as well. And, you know, that's like a party trick. We're like, oh, oh, say something <laughs> in Norwegian. And it's like, what do you want me to say? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> that's the weirdest thing is about being bilingual is, you know, people are like, oh, say something. But it's like, uh... <laughs> Well, I speak English here at home. Uh, I speak yeah. English with my wife. I speak English with our two kids, and I demand that they answer me in English. I've never. Now, our, our son is twelve, and our daughter is fourteen. I've never mm-hmm. spoken Norwegian to them. I always speak English, and I've always demanded that they answer me in English. Yeah. So they're truly and how is that well, just no problems. They're truly bilingual. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we could be sitting. Uh, sitting here at home and, and they'll speak English to me and then turn to their mother in the next sentence and speak Norwegian to her because she speaks Norwegian with them. That's amazing. So That's we, my goal. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and people make such a big deal about that. The, the thing is to just do it, just speak English with your child and, and then demand mm-hmm. that your child answers you in English. And you do that from day one, like we did. And it's, it's not an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because yeah, that's what I'm doing. I bought all my books in English, and yeah. you know, if my husband wants to, my husband reads to me English right now. But I'm sure he'll get some books going and start reading to a Norwegian. Yeah. But I guess what I notice of my friends is once their children start going to Barnahage, um, you know, then the Norwegian kind of takes over and they yeah. stop wanting to respond in English. So, but you know, I guess you just gotta. But I get don't think, it. yeah, I don't think that'll be an issue as long as as long as you're consistent in speaking English with your child and demanding that your child answers you in English, even when they start in daycare, it will never it will never be an issue. I think people make a big deal of of of, of nothing when it comes yeah. to that. The, the 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 child will adapt to whatever language you present it with, and if it's presented with both English and Norwegian, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I've already made some changes, like with my in-laws, you know, since the baby came, I just switched back to English, and now I'm, exactly. I'm even texting them in English, because it's like, you know, it's so easy to slip back into old habits, if you don't just make that change, it's not gonna... Yeah, yeah. All my social media, I do that in English, but um, 
work related things. Of course, I just speak Norwegian. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when I do stand up, I do my stand up routine in English as well. Yeah, that's I have to. <laughs> if yeah, I'm gonna... I was gonna say, how do you find with humor and Norwegian? Well, it's there, there's some things that I have to adapt, and there's some mm-hmm. things like some some English, some American English wordplay. Um, yeah, I've tried it that. and it doesn't go over. It doesn't go over very well. So it's just an extra challenge when I write for my stand up routine. I just have to write in a way that that the audience will understand that they'll that they'll get it. But sure. uh, but I have to do it in English. I have to be myself when I'm up yeah. there. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's that being yourself piece. Sometimes yeah. you just have to. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So you've been in Norway now for five years. How's it been yeah. going? How's it been going? You know, it was a lot tougher than we ever imagined. Um, when me and my husband decided that we were going to, I was, we met, first of all, we met um, studying in Minnesota and fell in love and we decided I was going to come here and we do our life together. We just thought, oh, no big deal. Now he Chris was, just, he was, he was a Norwegian studying in Minnesota. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. He, um, yep. So we, he went to um, Hamlin and I guess Hamlin has a relationship with the university in Bergen. So each year they send Norwegians over to study. Okay. Um, right. So yeah. Um, we thought I would just come over here and maybe be able to teach English. And then I spend my summers in America and, you know, la la la, just float <laughs> off to the sunset. <laughs> but uh, Did it go that smoothly? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the challenges that you uh, that you were faced with? You know, I think the biggest thing was um, just getting a, how hard it was to find a job and, you know, get started with the Norwegian courses. Um, we actually got married pretty early on to just help with the immigration processes. So, but we had been paying for Norwegian courses um, when... We didn't have to, which is a shame, I guess, like after you're married, you're if you're an American, that is, you're entitled to um, free Norwegian courses through the Volksmapplering. And so um, that was good to find that out. And I think once I did, was it six months or a year of that, I was able to get a job in a restaurant. Okay. So how did know, it go with the language? With the learning the language? How did that go? Yeah, you know. I loved learning languages my whole life. Um, I took Japanese and French um, in high school. So I just thought, okay, I, I love learning languages, but you know, it's a different thing when you're doing it for your life and not just um, a well, there's grade. An, there's an added pressure, you know, you have yes. to, you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, how long did it take you uh, to be able to converse with Norwegians? Hmm. Gosh. That's hard to think back to that. Uh, I would say maybe the first, after the first year, um, I was able to do a it. A year, okay. Mm-hmm. That's a long time to be frustrated. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> because that was a know, year without a job, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I got my first job at a restaurant actually through uh, a connection I made um, in my Norwegian courses. And, you know, I was just happy to have something that was just part time. Um, And that also strengthened my language skills then. So, you know, it's it's good. I started there and um, got this my foot in the door. But as someone with a psychology degree, you know, that wasn't exactly what I had seen myself doing at. Let's see. I was 25 years old, maybe. Yeah, so. and so you were in a situation where you had to totally redefine your work life persona, so to speak. Mm-hmm. That that's uh, I went through that myself. I mean, that's uh, that was probably my biggest challenge. I got a job right away, but it took me a long time to kind of leave my old work persona, my old job, my, that old that meaningfulness of my previous job in the states. It took a long time to leave that behind. That, yeah. was a, that was the biggest challenge for me. That was the biggest challenge about coming here. Yep. But it I was think I'm still working on that, to be honest. You know, five years in, it's still sure. uh, Well, yeah, eight, 18 years in, and it's still hard. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. things were so different when I came here. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the process was for you to get your residency permit and, and all mm-hmm. of that stuff. But for me, you know what I did? We came here and a couple of days after getting here, well, maybe a, a week or two after getting here, we go to the police station and I stood in line for about 15 minutes and they stamped my passport and 
That was it. I had my residence. What? That's how simple it was back then. Yeah. No way. Yes way. No paperwork. No like. paperwork. Nothing. Wow. That's how simple it was back then. And um, sh shockingly simple. I remember reacting to the simplicity of the whole thing. I'm like, these people have no idea who I am. I could be a one <laughs> criminal. I could be, I, you know, I could be, and they, yeah. they, di they didn't ask. They didn't check anything. It was just stamp, stamp, a, f a couple of questions like, um, you know, what do I plan on doing? Do I have a job? Does my wife have a, have a job? And then, and that was it. I think the whole process, wow. I stood in line for about 15 minutes and then the whole process took about five minutes after that. That was it. I'm simple. shocked. Simple. And then, um, <clears throat> and then the language class, I went to that class for two days and it mm -hmm. was boring and I quit. So I, I have, I've, I've learned Norwegian on my own. I don't know what wow. the rules are. Don't you have to take a language class? You, there's no choice. You have to take it now if you want residency. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you have, like you have to complete, oh, is it 300 hours or maybe even 600 hours? Honestly, okay. it's been a yeah. while, so I don't remember exactly yeah. um, what the number is. But yeah, you have to. Yeah. And then I think it's even baked into like um, either becoming a permanent resident or, um yeah, I think it's baked in Yeah, like see, that. and that wasn't an issue. I, I got offered the language classes, and I took it, uh, mm -hmm. but it lasted two days. It was boring. It was useless, so I dropped it. <laughs> two days. Yeah, that, that <laughs> was, a little I different. will say that's another adjustment for me. Um, you know, I don't know. I came from college, and I didn't know what to expect out of, you know, the free education. And, you know, I kept getting, like, I'd have a different teacher, like, two days of the week. And a lot, I found that to be really inconsistent. You yeah. know, you're trying to adapt to the teaching styles, and they've got, like, two teachers going on. And, yeah, it was really, for me, it was really hit or miss. You know, I think I had a couple teachers that really helped helped me learn a lot, but then some other ones that were just kind of, maybe just kind of floating on by, you know, doing the job. Yeah. You know? From talking with other immigrants who have come to Norway, uh, you know, fairly recently in the last five or 10 years, it seems like based on what they're telling me, it seems like no, the Norwegian system doesn't really take that language class very seriously. Mm -hmm. It seems to be kind of a rough shod, uh, you know, come what may process. There's no real structure in it. It mm -hmm. seems and a lot of people are coming out of it saying they were dissatisfied and they didn't really learn much. I mean, some of us, some of us Americans uh, are struggling with the, with the language, and and it's not because we're we're dumb. It's because the language, the the language classes don't seem to be set up to properly teach the language. That's what I'm hearing over and over and over again. Yeah, I was really let down. Like right before yeah. I took the test, you know, I had been moved up to the B2 class. And then now what is that? What are these the, what are these different levels? I don't even know the Oh I'd have to like dig out that sheet, but I think the B2 level is basically like you can discuss the news, politics, you know, okay. uh be able to write like an essay, um okay. that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, you need, oh yeah, like the level that you need to be at to study in Norwegian okay. is B2, B2, if you're going to okay. study here um, at the university level. Um, so basically in the fall, I was brought up to that class, but then by winter, you know, some of my classmates were taking the test. And so my class was disbanded and I was planning on taking the test in the springs. So then I went back to the um a to B one class. And that was, that was the biggest disservice I could have gotten. Wow. You know, I already knew all that stuff in that class. It wasn't, I wasn't getting the vocab I needed for the writing, you know, to be challenged. It, it, that's it terrible. Well. That's, that's pretty terrible. I mean, it's, it's almost like the people language is key. Okay. You can get by, you can get by if you don't speak Norwegian, but I don't think Norway or the immigrants who come here want to just get by. They want to be successful, mm -mm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of that success means that one must be proficient in the language. So it, it just, it, it baffles me that that class isn't taken more serious. It's that it's, that it's not a better offer, that it's not more yeah. structure. There's not more structure in that. Uh, I, I don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a, what'd you say, a psychology degree? 
Yep. Yeah. Now, are you are you taking any steps towards finding that kind of work here, uh, getting certified? Um, what, what are your thoughts? It's tempting because, you know, I, I like people and I want to help them. You know, that's all I, that's why I studied psychology. Um, I originally had wanted to be a marriage and family therapist. Um, but I feel like, uh, I don't know. If I go through the motions to get that education, can I survive here doing that sort of work? I don't know. I would think you I, could. I only, I only know my struggle, um, you know, with finding jobs now. And, you know, I really feel discriminated against in that process. So I, I just, I, I do feel very scared for the, my future. The D That's word. why I kind of veered off to graphic design. Um, because if I get that qualification, then I could start doing some remote work from the U.S. I see. Yeah. Yeah, that is pretty much a, yeah, you don't need a, yeah, you're not dependent on an office in any given location when you're a graphic designer. That's pretty much international. I know my, uh, the graphic designer I work with, Miss Ellen Leland, who does all of my logos and everything, she's mm -hmm. back in the States, so you can do that yeah. from wherever. But, um, yeah. but okay, so, so you're worried about being able to be a successful psychologist here in Norway. Or any, any, anything any job let's talk on it you said the d word discrimination yeah what, uh, let's tie this all together why why do you feel it would it why do you f experience it as difficult to succeed here in norway you know i think the moment my resume goes in there and my pictures on there i don't have a norwegian high school and i have norwegian language test results on my resume it's phew, thrown out the door um, you know, even for jobs that require the B1 speaking level and I've got B2, you uh -huh. know, I don't get any sort of callback or any sort of anything. What kind of jobs um, are those? What kind of job requires a B1 level that you've um, applied for? Barnhog assistant, for example. A daycare assistant. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I'm and just you know, tra translating just... for those who are non-Norwegian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that didn't even, I, I didn't even think about that. Sorry. Um, so basically I did I have a extensive background with children as well. Um, I started like nannying and babysitting since when I was 15 years old. And then after I finished my bachelor's degree, I started working in daycare because I didn't know what I wanted to do then. So I worked there for two years. So it was particularly interesting to me that, you know, after I, you know, got my Norwegian test results, um, you know, and I had the daycare experience, how come I don't get any callbacks wow. to any of these daycares who need daycare assistance. And that's even below. I was a lead teacher. So that's even below what I was at. So it's like, you know, and I think the, the nail in the coffin for me was there was like an English speaking daycare um, job. Yeah. And I had three glowing letters of reference from people I worked with in America. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even get a call for an interview. Interesting. And that's somewhere where I have relevant experience now when someone gets your application and they look at your name um your name doesn't look terribly foreign for, right. for norway for norway you know mm -hmm. carissa reinsborg or carissa reinsborg you know it, it's, you it's, it's 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 it, it rhymes <laughs> with all things yeah, norwegian yeah. it rhymes with all things norwegian so it's not your name you know because a lot of people who have uh, arabic names uh, or, or names that are obviously foreign. And when I say foreign, I'm saying non-Norwegian. Yes. Uh, those people are struggling. Okay. So there, it's, it's not your name that's keeping you out of the job market. What is it that you feel is keeping you from getting the job that you want? Cause it's not your name. Honest, it's not my name. Honestly, I feel like it's my race. You know, I've had, um, yeah, so my old neighbor, the daycare that they brought their children to, she even tried to refer me in. Still, nothing. Yeah. A Norwegian, well, you know, tried to help me in, and that still didn't work. So it, it's um, you know, you start thinking, you know, okay, you know, I have someone who's vouching for my language abilities, my yeah. kindness, my natural ability with children. You know, yeah. What's that missing piece of yeah. the puzzle then? Your race, yeah. And for those who are listening, you are a black woman, black American woman. That's right. Mm -hmm. Black and <laughs> just, proud. Just so they, uh, just so they understand. Yeah. So, 
have you had any, and, and I'm not doubting you in the slightest bit, believe you me. I mean, I have my own story <laughs> to tell about, about discrimination over here. But um, have you had any, you know, because some people listening to this will be like, oh my gosh, here we go again. It's another, right. another black woman complaining, you know, yeah. she's not discriminated mm-hmm. against. She just has been unlucky and she's using her color as an excuse. What do you say to that person? How do you, how do you convince that person that there is a problem? Because the, the problem of discrimination is not just your problem. This is the society's problem. They may not realize mm-hmm. it, but this is a societal problem. So how do you convince the doubter? How do you convince the one who thinks you're just using it? Your, your color as an excuse. What do you say to them? I think I'd have to go into um, my experience, how I was treated when I was pregnant. Um, I encountered a midwife who was racist. And this was in period. Oslo. There's no other ex- and, sorry? This was in Oslo. This was in Oslo. Uh-huh. Oh. Um, you know, there's no explanation. You know, if someone's asking you about how often you wash, or implying your skin is dirty, that is racism, period. How did she imply, how, uh, what was it she said or did that, um, that made you think she was assuming your I skin was... Roll it back. Roll yeah, it do back. that. Tell, tell us what happened. Yeah. So, you know, my first appointment, I went with my Norwegian spouse, um, and the midwife was all right. Um, we had gone to an early scan and we got, um, you know, confirmation from the doctor that, you know, this is how far we were along and this is the expected due date. And, you know, she took the time to type up a letter to bring to the, um, midwife at at the health station. Um, and the first thing she does is like, gives it back to me and sits there and calculates, um, my, um, estimated due date, which is like, okay, you know, that's, that's whatever that that's not a problem. That's not where the issue arose. You know, the first appointment was all right. It was when I went by myself, it was just a completely other different experience. Um, so you notice a difference, you notice a difference in the way they treated you from when your husband was with you as opposed to when you were alone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, this is something I'm naturally very conscious about. You know, I, I don't want to rep myself, represent myself poorly. So, you know, of course I show up with makeup, my hair's done, my nice maternity clothes. You know, I'm not showing up in, you know, raggedy clothes. But if I wanted to, that's my prerogative. But, sure. you know, that's always something I'm conscious of. I, I feel like Norwegians are never wearing sweatpants outside. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> I better not either. <laughs> um but yeah, you know, just from the way she was speaking or reason to me, like I didn't understand, like she kept, she re- re- repeated like chewing gum, chewing gum. Like I, I didn't understand. It's like, um, I don't even need Norwegian <laughs> class to know what chewing gum is in Norwegian. I so have, it, yeah. I, I joke with my wife all the time because I get that too. You know, people will say, um, uh, I'll say it in English so that the listeners understand, but they'll say something simple like, um, like, uh, you know, like uh, yesterday I drove to, someone speaking to me would say, yeah, yesterday I drove into Oslo and then they'll be, Oslo, Oslo, have you heard of it? Oslo, you know where that is? And, and it's like that, it's it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not Norwegian, but I'm not a dummy either. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. And, and that's just, or, or like, like you see, you know, chewing gum, chewing gum, chewing, you know what that is? Chewing gum, you know, and it's, it's like they're, they're, they're. They're, they're really, really showing that they don't think you have much knowledge about the most simple things in life. They're really yes. showing that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it fits. So, it rhymes. It rhymes with your experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, she just kind of like, I don't know, I, it, this was like an 8 a.m. appointment and like she basically didn't know who, she, who I was. She needed to like calculate all the due date and all the information again. And then basically we were talking about my travel plans and I let her know that, you know, I'm going to be traveling to America um, in my first trimester of my pregnancy and in the second. And that like that flipped a switch. She was basically like, oh, well, if you go to America, you're going to contract MRSA and, um, you know, you really need to stay in Norway. Um, you know, she was highly uncomfortable with me going to America. And, I, you know, I try to say, well, you know, I've got a family member getting married. Um, and then it's my niece's birthday who I, she, you know, she was turning two. You know, I had been her first birthday mm. and she was like, well, everybody has a birthday and you, you, you shouldn't be traveling to America. 
um, or basically anywhere that wasn't Norway wasn't okay with her. You know, she was, she used an example. She was thinking of the cleanliness or, or what was the issue? Sorry. Was she thinking of the cleanliness or what was the yes. issue that she. The cleanliness of the medical institutions were not as clean as Norway. She I said see. that. She did say that. And as she was saying, you know, when people want to go on vacation, um, when they're pregnant to Italy, you know, that's an issue there. So it's, I was basically made to feel like if I leave Norway, I'm gonna, the medical institutions are not good enough. And it's very funny. You know, my wife is a nurse and I think at one point, uh, she's, she stopped this now, but at one point she used to be on this trip about the American hospitals being dirty, America being dirtier in general. Uh, mm -hmm. But I told her, see, I hit her with knowledge. I said, um, yeah. you do know that they named a rat after Norway, right? The brown rat is called Nor uh, uh, Rotus Norvegicus. That is the Latin name for the brown rat. <laughs> and ever since then, about 15, 20 years ago when I said that, ever since then, she's never said anything about cleanliness in America. <laughs> you gotta, That's amazing. Got to hit them no with idea. facts. Yeah. Also, have you ever heard, you've heard of scabies, right? Scabies. It's like a, a um, like a parasite that gets in the skin. It's called scabies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The proper name for it is Norwegian scabies. Did you no, know that? No, it's not. Yes, it is. Look it up. <laughs> Look it up. See, I, I figure this stuff out and I use it on my wife all the time to keep her in check. So. <laughs> That's something I got to get better at. When people challenge me, I tend to like, you know, avoid conflict or, you know, let them uh, have their own belief because I don't like convincing people who don't want to be convinced. Well, you'll um, have an easier life when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hold on a second. I need to turn on a fan and you need to tell me if this fan is making a lot of noise in the microphone. I'm just going to turn yeah. on the fan. No problem. This podcast is as live as it can be. We turn on fans and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Does it? Do you hear any noise in the background? Let me see. Let's be quiet for a minute. I know. We're okay. Good. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, Norwegian uh, Rotis Norwegicus. Look it up, and also Norwegian <laughs> scabies. <laughs> Look it up, people. <laughs> Look it up, people. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, but back to, back to your experience though. So this, this midwife, this, this midwife was very adamant. She was very insistent that where it were you to go to the United States, you would come back dirtier. <laughs> basically. Yes. She went as far to say that, like, this is where my skin came into place. She was like, I don't know how often you wash, but your skin's dirty and you need to wash your sheets. And if you get MRSA, you have to wash your sheets every day. Just really unnecessary. Yeah, that would, uh, that would, uh, I would rate, I would definitely raise an eyebrow if someone spoke to me like that. Yeah. Did you confront it, her? No way. I just was like, okay, just keep it quiet until the appointment's over. Cause it wasn't even over. She had to do the Doppler for the heartbeat for my baby. And, you know, I was dreading that because I already felt so uncomfortable after she made those comments. And then to get up on that table and show her my tummy, it just oh, uh -huh. didn't feel right. And then to make matters worse, she acted like, you know, I was diseased or something. She barely wanted to touch me. She, um, you can tell a lot about someone's bedside manner, about how they treat you during the Doppler because they put the gel on your tummy and, you know, they got to find the right spot. Yeah. And then here's the test. If they wipe off the gel on your tummy or if they just give you something to wipe it off. That's the I that's see. something I noticed was a difference between caregiver to caregiver. So you can believe she didn't wipe off the gel off my tummy. Um, she didn't say a word about my baby's heartbeat. So I left that um, check-in not knowing how my baby's heartbeat was good or wow. bad, you know, wow. how many beats per minute. So I was basically shaking when I left the door. And then as soon as the door closed, I just sobbed and called my husband. Wow. That was too much for me. So did you guys uh, file any sort of formal complaint? Did you call her boss? Did you? I did email. I did send an email in Norwegian um, to detail the experience. Because um, she also was telling me that, like, I couldn't use American apps to follow my pregnancy because the information would be incorrect, you know. And I, I think I don't want to judge, but it, it seems like to me that woman's never been to America. <laughs> um, it sounds like she's reading some uh, some anti 
anti-America literature or pamphlets or something, and she's just <laughs> going. With, she's going with all the cliches or something. I don't. I don't know. That that's just a strange. It, it, that woman had issues. <laughs> that, yeah, that woman had issues. And she shouldn't be not working with a pregnant woman because I. Had, I'd actually, I don't, I wouldn't understand if it's at the end of the workday, but this was literally like 8 a.m. I was the first appointment. There was no reason to be so fed well, Even up if with it's the end of the workday, I don't think that medical professionals are allowed to be tired. And when I <laughs> say that, I'm saying I don't, they're not allowed to show their tiredness. They're not allowed to have their personal, um, uh, you know, hangups uh, c- come to light while they're at work. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, uh, that would be no excuse if she was tired or if it was at the end of the shift or something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you're in such a vulnerable position when you're in a hospital. You don't go there, uh, you know, ready to do battle, <laughs> ready to defend no. your very essence. That's not what you're supposed to do. Um, and I'm thinking in Oslo as well, which, which should be a relatively cosmopolitan city. Um mm-hmm. I wonder, I, I, I can't imagine that this is the first time, you know, you're not the only one who's had that experience with this lady, probably. And that's, no. that's just interesting, because that sounds like it would be something that would happen out in the districts, you know, where they don't have exposure to foreigners, especially, right. black, especially black foreigners, uh, mm-hmm. so that they have maybe their preconceived notion, their prejudices and, and whatnot. It's, it, it's, it's eye-opening. I think it says something that that happened in Oslo. Yeah. So, you know, we compl- I, you know, I, I, I wrote about this in the International Moms Facebook group and every, and then there was one per- person who does work in the field and she said, please, please, please contact her superior because we need to get this kind of feedback. So I did. What you, what kind of response did you get? You know, the generic, um, basically <laughs> we have to follow the, um, I'm trying to think of the English word now. Well, they, they, they need to follow what the, basically the midwives and the private doctors are two separate entities. So that was like in the response to her disregarding the letter I got from the doctor from my first ultrasound. Um, and then that was kind of like the same response, like, oh, we have to tell people to follow the Norwegian apps and pregnancy, pregnancy information. And, um, you know, I, I guess I understand there wasn't really any sort of a sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. There wasn't any sort of an acknowledgement that she had done wrong per se. Just just um, change your change your midwife if you don't like her. Essentially, I guess I was thinking about the app thing. Uh, she said, don't use any American apps because the information will be wrong. And I'm thinking maybe she meant because so- certain units of measurement will be different, not wrong, but different. And they won't be able to translate that into the units of measurement that they use. Maybe it was something like that. That's a nice positive um, point of view, but I guess. Now, she know. sounds like she sounds like she was a total bitch with all these other things. But but yeah. the app, I'm just thinking of the app thing. Maybe, maybe that could be what she was talking about. Well, so basically. Um, you use the apps to follow your pregnancy. So like when you're 14 weeks, you might feel these symptoms. When you're 20 weeks, you might feel these symptoms. So it wasn't really anything to do with okay. um, measurements. And that in that particular instance, it was just kind of to follow your pregnancy. And this month, your your baby is the size of a m- watermelon or, you know, just just little incidental things like that. Just 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 to follow up, you know. Okay. Uh, well, I tried to give her a chance, but <laughs> he tried. Yeah. <laughs> so that that is a very um, that that's I mean that's a traumatic experience to go into a hospital in a vulnerable situation like that. You're vulnerable enough in any other situation, but here you are pregnant, and then that's what you experience. Now, has that colored? <laughs> excuse the pun. Has that colored your view of the Norwegian health system? Now, have you? Are you jaded? Are you on the are you are you in the defensive position when it when you walk into a hospital? You know, that certainly didn't help. You know, also when I looked at how she filled out my health card, um, you know, she filled out my husband's information just fine. But for me, because I was a student, like she didn't write that I had a degree already, like because you're, you're supposed to check off like information about the, the obviously the mom and the father. But it was like she was happy to fill out my husband's information, but mine, she left blank. So when I found a different midwife, she then asked me, oh, you know, what's your education level? Check. And then, um, you know, the first one 
the the mid the midwife who I had the traumatic experience with, she assumed we weren't married because I didn't have my ring on, and it just you know wow. whether or not I'm married isn't relevant either. You know how, it, how did that come feel, up? How did that come up? The issue of being oh, married or not married. I guess they do keep track of it on your health card because um, okay. I think that comes up later with the paternity of the child because that health card follows you through your pregnancy. I see. Mm-hmm. And she checked off that you guys were not married. Or it, she didn't. She she. She assumed we weren't married and we had to correct her. I see. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. You know, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. I've been in a lot of hospitals. You know, I've had uh, seven, eight operations on my shoulder. So I've been in a hospital a lot. Wow. And, and um, I don't, I don't want to get it. I don't want to say this wrong because the the surgeon and the team that's around me now for all my shoulder rehab they're great people um but i've had experiences at other hospitals and even at that same hospital but before i landed with this particular group that's that's helping me now uh the the micro the micro racism the um let's just take the word racism out of it but the 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 microaggression uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the bad treatment that one tends to, I mean, you can't help but uh, assume or you can't help but think that it's because of the color of your skin. Uh, that assumption, what I got the most, not so much now, but what I used to get the most was the assumption that I couldn't speak Norwegian. Yeah. Um, and then when I would speak Norwegian and they heard I was, I was fluent, then it would be that patronizing thing. Oh my gosh, you can speak Norwegian. Oh, you're so smart. And it's, it, it's, it's, uh, I can't, I don't know. It, it's hard to formulate that. You just have to feel it to understand what it is. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I try to, I try to just let those things roll. I do let those things just, just roll off of me. And, 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 and uh, you know, I'm not afraid of a debate or argument, but when those things happen, I just kind of let it roll off because I don't want to get, you know, if I'm going to lay down on the operation table, I don't want them pissed <laughs> off at me. As, as I'm <laughs> but, um, but it's there, those microaggressions, the micro racism, if we can call it that it's, it's, uh, it's there. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it kind of, it kind of stinks that that's an extra thing that we have to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I prefer to do my medical things in English because that's the thing, oh, really? you know, okay. if, it feels like you're kind of convincing them that like, you know, you have whatever issue and it, it just, it seems like an unnecessary hurdle to deal with the kind of being talked down to, yeah. you know, I don't like it. I would say not even just medical experiences. I would say just in general, um, you know, some, some the way people have spoken in the region to me, some words really sting to hear and it makes me not want to speak in the region like what? because of it. Um, so I used to work in, um, a different job. Um, I had, um, a manager who kind of made my life hell the months I worked under them. And, um, you know, I can still hear her. Oh, just, she would, you know, just use, just speak to me really disrespectfully. And, you know, I, I, I didn't, do anything but be nice and try to, you know, work hard and, you know, do the best I can in the job. And, you know, she would call me outside of work hours to shout at me about how I did my, how how my service was in the job. And she'd like literally 7am I'd gotten a call. And, um, you know, after I work at evening shift, she'd call and shout at me. And it's just, you know, that after months and months and months, it makes you just like have a, complete negative dissociation negative association with Norwegian if someone's using it with you like that interesting now how long were you at that job where this woman was was treating you like that um I yeah it was 10 months and you know she, she would do anything like one time um I believe, and my other colleagues did too, that she would try and sabotage how I left the condition of the workplace. And she tried, took pictures and said I left the refrigerator open and just silly little things just so she could. She really had it out. out for you. Mm-hmm. 
um, I would say the biggest thing is she like wrote me up for pushing a button on the register <laughs> that everyone pushes. And it was only me. <laughs> What was it like a big red button that said, don't push this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish it were. I would be shaken if I was that kind of button. Now, was no this, was this when you were relatively new in Norway? Uh, -uh. um, I think this was after I'd been here for three years. Okay. But, but still mm -hmm. the job market hadn't really opened for you. So is that maybe why you stayed on at that job for these 10 months? Um, Yeah. Yeah, okay. we had just bought our apartment um, as well. So, you know, it wasn't the best time to be quitting. And, you know, I guess, I don't know, it, it, when that person wasn't there, the job wasn't too bad. Okay. But when that person was there um, or her wrath could be felt, yeah, it was. So it wasn't the job, it was the leadership. Yes. That was the issue. Okay. I see. Because then when she, when she eventually left and a different manager came in, um, completely different experience. So Interesting. it was good that things ended positively after I gave my um, notice. So things finished nicely. And, you know, some of my regulars um, were so had so many kind words. And, you know, that that woman had me believing I was terrible at my job and that customers mm -hmm. didn't like my service. When in actuality, it was the opposite. They quite liked me and um, were sad to see me go and thought the other person should go and not me. And, you know, one of my regulars who um, he came in um, in the mornings and a lot of times it wasn't busy, you know, especially if he's he, sometimes he's my first customer of the day. So we get to talking and, yeah. you know, I, I let him in to let him know a little bit what was going on. And, you know, he actually a Norwegian man, he wrote to corporate to complain about how that woman treated me and he didn't think I should be leaving my job. And, um, okay. that made me, I was so touched. That made me feel so welcome here. That, well, it's always know, a good region, feeling to find an ally. Absolutely. Yeah. He stuck his neck out for me and he didn't have to, but he, he took the time to, you know, collect the information and write the, write a letter to corporate. And of course, you know, they supported the, um, management and not, the employee but you know just the fact that i have that email and yeah. you know i think it's maybe once a year we check in with each other but i think that's so lovely. Oh, there you go friend for life <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what, what is it uh we kind of touched on this but I, I i wanted a little bit more um insight into how you're thinking what is it that yeah. makes you want to get into graphic designing and not try and get started with psychology here is it is it the is it the certification process because there's a, there's a rather difficult process that you would have to go through to get your psychology education and 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 licensing certified here in norway that's a long process is that why you don't yeah so and i only have bachelor's level um so i i need to obviously i was going to need to take a master's in the u.s as well um but yeah, the certification and um, I, I'd like to be able to have a job sooner, but, you know, a little part of me is just afraid that even if I do all these, these things and jump through the hoops, there's not going to be a job waiting for me. Okay. And then you're, you, so you're just thinking that the, I don't know, when I think of graphic designer, I think the, of that as a very independent job. You can do that yeah. yourself. You don't need a boss, you know, whereas if you're a psychologist, you would have to possibly, I mean, you could go into private practice, but you would, you would possibly have to work in a, um, yeah, a professional environment with a hospital and, and things like that. So is that what you want to avoid? Or rather, is 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 the independence of graphic design? Is that what draws you to it? The independence. Um. Yeah, I, I think it is nice to have an independent job, but you know, I guess the way I see it, I'm still very close with my family and friends in the U.S. So if I am able to just pick up my job and do it wherever, that could be really nice. Yeah. But at the same time, it would be great to, you know, have a professional, nice job in Norway, you know, have that stamp, you know, of, okay, you know, I've got all my ducks in a row here. I was able to fully assimilate and, you know, get that nice job that I would be able to get in the U.S. Well, that's a well-paid job, I, I tell you, depending on what kind of work you're commissioned to do that's a well-paying job to be a graphic designer here in norway i tell yeah. you some of the prices there's lots of openings and yeah. you know it's 
oh. it seems like a good area to go into. But, you know, I do wonder, like, oh, uh, you know, there's that need to help people. And especially, you know, other foreigners, I see that need. So it's it's tough. I'm trying to think what you would be able to do with the education that you have and be able to help people like right now. Um, how about a psychotherapist? That's not a, um, that's not something that you need a, a, a long term schooling to do. Psychotherapist here in, here in Norway. Oh, okay. I had a guest. I can't remember which episode it was. Um, I'll tell you which episode it was. Hold on. Let me just log in here and see. But I had a, <clears throat> I had a uh, guest on my podcast who was a sexologist and psychotherapist. Ms. Oh, uh, that's, that's interesting. Miss Lexi. Now, she has uh, some education, but you don't need any kind of a, a special degree here in Norway to be a psychotherapist. I don't know. That's something you might want to check out. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm open to, um, you know, all opportunities and, you know, just cause I want to be independent isn't cause I, you know, don't like people. I, I, I quite like people and want to help them. It's, find, it's find just, the, you I, could, you could find the episode I did with Alexandra, uh, Corin, K O R E N. I can't remember which number on my podcast. It Cor was. Okay. Alexandra Corin. Okay. She, um, I can do that. I'm going to see her tonight. Actually, she's coming to, uh, to my show in Oslo. I got a, sh a stand up oh. show tonight. So oh. I'll, I'll finally get to meet her in person. Uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting, but she, uh, she's a psychotherapist and a sexologist and, um, and quite successful at it. And mm -hmm. she, and this is here in Norway. This is here in Norway. Um, yeah. she lives for some time. She's, she's actually from Chile, uh, but mm -hmm. they emigrated here. So at some point when she was a kid, I think she was six years old when they came to Norway. But then here recently, she had been living in London, but now she's back in Norway and working. Oh, wow. And um, doing quite well. <clears throat> and she is, you know, of course, she, she'll, she'll take any client that she sees fit to take, but she has experienced that so many of her clients are immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, Latin American immigrants who feel like they're not really getting the service that they need from, yeah, from from a from a from a Norwegian, for example, who may not understand their situation. So you, as right. a black woman, as a minority here in Norway, as an immigrant here in Norway, if you were to get into that line of work or any similar line of work, we're in a position to help people. Uh, you might be an important source of help for some of these people who have experienced things like what you have experienced, you know, discrimination, racism, lack of understanding in, 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 in this case, in the, in the, in the therapist's world, there's an idea for you. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that, you know, the immigrant population is an underserved population and yeah. we need some more people around to help each other out. I was even thinking about that back in my Norwegian course days, you know, it's, um, Oh, sorry. I now my uh, my baby's come out of the room. I wonder if that's picking up on the microphone because my door's open. I can go yeah, shut it. We're hearing it on the microphone. It doesn't bother me at all. I mean, that's just part of life. This podcast yeah. is as live as it gets. If you want to shut the door, you can. Gets. Yeah, I'll shut the door and see if that helps. But I, yeah, I think I think hubby has to give the baby a bottle. He'll be okay soon. <laughs> I'll be okay. It's yeah. it's not easy as a new mom to hear the baby cry. I know it's necessary, but. Uh, you know, that never bothered me. My wife used to get all bent out of shape and stressed when, uh, especially when our son would cry. It, just ne it never bothered me. He's no, crying. Oh, change, change his diaper. Oh, he's still crying. Give him something to eat. Oh, he's still crying. Well, that's his problem. No, <laughs> I'm not that, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that cold, but it does. It never, it never stressed me out like it did my wife. I don't know. Maybe that's a maternal thing. I don't know. I, I really feel like, yeah, it's uh, it definitely hits um, women differently than men. I don't know what it is, but yeah. <laughs> I tell you, some of the happiest moments of my life, the happiest period of my life was the uh, nine months, or was it, I think it was 10 months I was home from work with my daughter. Um, when she was born, my wife stayed home for the first six weeks, and then she went back to work, and then I stayed home for nine or 10 months with, uh, wow. with our daughter. And uh, one of the best uh, best moments of my life, absolutely. 
that's so awesome yeah. that you had the opportunity to do so. Yeah, yeah. And well, she was able to, ret- you know, you guys figure out what worked best for you and you did it. And I, I'm all about that. You know, whatever works best for people, yeah. you don't have to follow these norms. Yeah, she went uh, went back to work and I stayed home and it, it worked out great. And uh, our, I, I tease my wife and I say, and our daughter is much better for that experience herself. <laughs> <laughs> If our son, if our son is acting up, I say, "See, look, there's your son. Look what you did." <laughs> so, so how did you um, divvy up the time um, with the son, your son? Uh, then I just took the regular. I don't know what is it Norway was offering at that time. Was it four weeks for the father? Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah, um, <clears throat> but it wasn't a solid four weeks because I was in business for myself. Uh, I used to own three gyms up in northern Norway. So really? even though I was, yeah. So, wow. so even though I was home, I wasn't totally home. I did have to go in and and, mm-hmm. and, and work a little bit at that time. But I, I think it was four weeks, though. Pretty much I was home for four weeks, off and on, kind of. <laughs> yeah. So, But only in Norway. I mean, I, I love that aspect of the Norwegian society that they really, really care about parenting and about uh, uh, child care. Um I, I, you know, it's just, un, it's unthinkable in America for the father to be able to stay home from work for nine or 10 months and take care of a kid. That's unthinkable. Right. I mean, you can do right. it, but your job won't be there when you get back. So, yeah. But here mm-hmm. in Norway, it, it, it wasn't an issue, you know. It's uh, pretty amazing. That's one of the things that I love the most about living here. I mean, it's not perfect here, but but it is it is nice. And one of the nicer things is... The focus, the focus on on uh, making it easier to raise a family. Absolutely, you know, yeah. just the you know, hearing from my friends that you know, you get to, you know, if you're breastfeeding, you get to leave work. At, what is it, an hour early, you know, to ensure yeah. that you're able to do so, and you know the. Yeah, the regulations with that are seem to be followed pretty well. But yeah. you know, I, I wouldn't know from personal experience, just from my friends. One difference I see is the whole thing with breastfeeding. Over here, women will just uh, pop that boob out and feed that child anyway. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, I see nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but it was so funny. My brother-in-law and his wife and their two kids came to visit us in the States when, when we were still living there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I took them, uh, they wanted to, you know, I was a cop at that time and they wanted to see the police station, you know. So yeah. I took them to the police station and then just all of a sudden, uh, my brother-in-law's wife asked for a chair. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe she's tired. So I get her a chair. She sits down <laughs> maybe she's tired. and pulls, you know, I thought maybe, yeah, maybe she's tired. And she pulls that thing out and starts feeding her baby like it was no big deal. I'm like, okay, you know, that's the way it should be. But the reaction among the office workers and the other cops, it was just, it was like chaos. Nobody said anything, right? But you could tell there was a ripple in the air, <laughs> mm-hmm. a nipple in the baby's mouth, and a ripple in the air. It was um, people just weren't people just react to that differently in the states. I've never understood that why that should be a taboo thing. Yeah, it's the most natural thing. I've never that- understood it. Yeah, it, uh, it's interesting. I wish there wasn't that um, judgment around, yeah. you know, however you choose to feed your baby, you know, that society puts the pressure on, you know, the mom, uh, the mother of the child feels enough guilt, whether she's breastfeeding or bottle feeding or doing both, you know, so then to have, <clears throat> um, you know, that added pressure that society adds, I wish we could change the narrative with that, you know, as a new mother myself. It's uh, it's pretty crazy that people get so bent out of shape over something that is so natural. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. Are you a feminist? I am a feminist. Absolutely. What is it? What is a feminist? How do you define a feminist, that? To me, is someone who is supportive of women and wants equality in all aspects of life. And it's not putting men down. It's not saying men are terrible. It's not men bashing. It's just that, you know, we need to make things equal, you know, with pay and, you know, every, every other aspect of the world. Do you think that there is a man bashing faction to the feminist movement? 
maybe some people interpret it, it that way, but um, you know, I that's not how I interpret it. I just think that, you know, for the longest time, you know, men have had more power than women, were kind of looked down upon because most more often than not, we're the ones raising the children, which is that's a hell of a job. And, you know, to say that women aren't fit for work after they've taken some years off to raise children. Um, I have a big problem with that because I think mothers are some of the most resourceful, well, time managed, quick on their feet people. You know, you're 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 given a job. It's to keep the small human alive. You know, if that's not, um, you know, being a fast paced work environment, then I don't know what is. So are you saying then that the child caring uh, that the major role in child caring should be played by the woman? Not at all. I think it's whoever whoever has the best capacity for it. Mm-hmm. What do so you- for me, personally, I combination feed my baby. I breastfeed my child when it suits me, and I also feed him bottles, and I feed him formula, too. So I wanted my husband to be, there's no reason why I have to be pinned down to my baby all the time and that I have to do the bedtime routine and, you know, the bath, you know, I wanted to create as equal of an experience with my child as I could with my husband. Um, But, you know, because of old um, roles, you know, gender roles, it's Mm -hmm. been actually quite hard to get him to, you know, get on board and be equal with me because I've created a way to make make it equal um are you saying he's resisting uh wanting to be or he, he's he's resisting uh an, a, a larger involvement is that what you mean or? yeah yeah i would say so because he is just not what he's socialized to and not what he's used mm-hmm. to so um it it is harder to kind of I think it would be a lot easier with a second child. So then he can kind of say, oh, okay, this is my role. Boom, boom, boom. But, you know, to be kind of floating along on uncharted waters, it's, it's, it's hard, but you know, he's, I say this culture comes from my family. You know, my sister has two children and, you know, everybody's involved with feeding the babies there. Mm -hmm. My brother gives bottles. My dad gives bottles, you know? Yeah. Interesting. What do you say then to the people who, because there's a, there's a narrative out there that uh, f- the feminist movement was and is a good thing, but the feminist movement is putting, they, they, they've created an ideal woman, and that ideal woman is the one who is, uh, you know, a go-getter, you know, she's working 60 hours a week in the corporate world, um, and she's getting paid, and, and she's active in, 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 the, in the work life, very active. She's a leader, tough woman, right? Mm-hmm. But she's also in charge at home. She's the one that's right. You know, in other words, they're saying you can have both. You can, you can be uh, as good of a homemaker as you are as, as a female in the corporate world. Uh, and there's some people who are saying that that is that 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 ideal woman is unattainable. Yeah. You can't you can't you can't you know if you're going to work sixty hours a week, then somebody else is going to have to pick up some of the slack at home. Uh huh. Absolutely. I think that's a another toxic pressure put onto women that who, we don't. Who puts need. that pressure? Who puts that pressure on them though? I think it, it's the society, you know, all our ideas that we, we grew up and we're kind of like, you know, all these ideas are kind of thrown at us our whole life. And then when it comes down to you, when you when you're actually in the role yourself, you think back to those ideas and you kind of beat yourself up about it. And, you know, I think there needs to be more empowerment of, you know, the, however, however it suits the individual. Um, you know, saying, you know, if the woman wants to be that power executive, that's completely perfect and fine. Sure, but, sure. you know, there shouldn't be pressure that she has to be super mom and do everything at home as well. There shouldn't be any judgment if she needs to have a nanny or, you know, the husband take over. Because, you know, if, if she's the breadwinner, let her be the breadwinner then. You know, it's perfectly okay if the husband wants to take on the, the role. Someone's got to take on the role with the more more involved role with the children. So, you know, I it guess, shouldn't, she I, shouldn't be shamed. I guess there's this idea out there that, that the women, they, they want it all. They want to be that corporate executive, but they also want to uh, stay in charge at home. 
and men are just getting pushed by the wayside. The role of men in a woman's life is getting smaller and smaller. There is a narrative out there that says that. I'm not saying I agree with that, but right. that narrative is out there. And I'm just, I'm just wondering how you, as a woman, as a, as a, as a self-proclaimed feminist, would answer that question. And the question is, who is putting that pressure on women to do both, to be in charge at home and be in charge in the office? Yeah, I, I is really it men? think it's because a lot, because a lot of women are blaming men for the plight of women. And in some areas, would, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I would say it's just in the age of social media, we're documenting everything. We're putting out all our accomplishments, you know, Snapchat stories, you know, all that is out there. And, you know, I think that's the demise of people's mental health. It's too much documentation. It's too much show off. It's, it's too much. And I think that alone is putting the pressure because you can say, oh, look at me. I do this and I do that. You know, you know, if we weren't at that level of showing, how, sharing how much we do with the others in that regard, I think this would look a little different. Yeah, people do put their best side up on social media, yes. you know. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody can uh, can set the table real nice and bring out some some decent looking china and and fill a glass up with wine and lay out a nice spread and make it look like you know they they they, they spent five hundred dollars for this dinner. But if you mm -hmm. zoom out, you might see that it's in a crappy kitchen with roaches crawling on the floor. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know what the reality is. But people seem to be living up to this 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 Instagram life or this Facebook life. That is not mm -hmm. based on reality and it's putting <laughs> demands on people. You know, I, we, we, we drastically limit, um, our daughters, our son's not on social media media at all. Uh, but our daughter is, but we limit it, uh, very much. And we are constantly in, in, in conversation with her about that, uh, yeah. to make sure she understands that some of those things out there does not, it is not reality. <laughs> it is someone's. No. It is someone's fantasy. It's so far from reality. So we try to make sure she's aware of that because I think a lot of kids. I don't know when did social media start getting big. I don't know twenty two thousand eight maybe. I don't know two thousand eight two thousand nine. I would say it started to take off when I went to college and I started college in two thousand eight. So so we're we're looking at twelve years now. Let's say you were twelve years old when you first got involved in social media, and if you got sucked into that fake Oof. world, that f that that false image of reality, and now you're twenty four, twenty five years old, I I. I, I I cry for the future of these young people who have grown up with nothing but social media. Oh, how how in the world are they going to tackle the real world? How are they going to do that? I know it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, they, the pressure, you know, I think there's like, there was this video going on about how like, you know, 12 year olds dance today and like how 12, how I dance as a 12 year old and like how they look so grown up and it's like, what? Like <laughs> I was maybe sneaking to put on mascara and maybe <laughs> Yeah, and these 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 twelve year olds are better at makeup than me. It's yeah. it's really sad. It's forcing them to grow up too soon, and yeah, it's nothing good can come of all this. Well, luckily, I actually don't have an Instagram account yeah. anymore. I I got off. I didn't like the show offy fakeness of it all. Yeah. You know, I I'm have, a very real person, and I don't I I want to share pictures with people, but at the same time, it's. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I have I have two Instagram accounts. I have one for my powerlifting and one for my art, so to speak, my music, my my podcast, uh, and my stand up. So yeah. I'm I'm on Instagram, <clears throat> but I don't. Um, I find it I find it tiring. If I were to go on Instagram and start looking it around, I get exhausting. tired. It's 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 yeah. um, it's too much fake imagery. And it just mm -hmm. wears me out and, and, yes. and I end up shaking my head and, and just turning it off. So I do my posts for what I do, but I'm not right, much. Right, in your niche. Yeah. And, I, and other than that, I'm just not, I'm just not interested. Mm -mm. Uh, no. Facebook, yeah. Facebook has its merits. Facebook can be quite entertaining. Of course, there's some idiots and people get nasty and there's a <laughs> lot of, and there's a lot of fake stuff going on there as well. But, but, uh, yeah. but I think Facebook is quite interesting and I've, I've used it to get back in touch with a lot of friends from school, uh, yeah. from high school, you know, 
uh, get back in touch with America, I guess, you know, with, mm-hmm. my, with my people that I, that I know from back home. So Facebook has its marriage, but, but Instagram is a cesspool. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. I, I agree with you with Facebook. You know, that's the thing that Facebook messenger is, you know, vital to talking with some people. Not everybody wants to download WhatsApp yeah. or yeah. Um, has an iPhone where they can message me. So yeah, it's nice to share some pictures, but I actually, you know, I've grown more private as I've gotten older, yeah. you know, I see that, you know, Facebook owns your pictures and, you know, anyone who's your Facebook friend can have access to your pictures. So I actually don't post pictures of my son. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't, we don't do that thing of uh, posting pictures of our kids because eventually they're going to see those pictures when they're adults and they might be embarrassed. Yeah. They don't. It, you know, and that's let, the other fact too. Yeah. They mm-hmm. need to be able to make that decision themselves. Uh, yeah. But the pictures I put out there, you know, there's some people who get all freaky and conspiracy theory and all that stuff. Oh, they've got your pictures. Yeah. They've got my pictures. So what? You know, yeah. I, I don't, uh, I just don't spend a lot of time worrying about that kind of stuff. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. I just don't want my pictures to show up in some ad somewhere that I didn't consent. That That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> that would be weird. That Imagine yeah. that. And that happens, you know, all of a sudden there's an ad for, for, I don't know, anal itching or something like that. And it's my picture. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> can you imagine if you saw something like that? Oh, oh geez. How unfortunate would that be? Oh my gosh. I don't know, anal itching. Well, yeah. that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I um, I hope that people who have listened to this can learn a little bit of something because there's a lot of people out there who will deny. You know, going back to your to your problems yeah. with your with your midwife and, and and facing discrimination in a place. You know, a hospital is a place where you're not supposed to have to worry about. You shouldn't have to worry about that. And I hope that by you telling your story and what you've experienced, it will be an eye opener for some people here in Norway because it's it's nice here. I'm doing well. I'm successful. But Norway has a lot to learn when it comes to their own xenophobia, microaggressions mm-hmm. towards minorities mm-hmm. and whatnot. Um, I think they close their ears off. They hear us talk about these things and they get defensive and then they go on the offensive and they say that we're making it up or we're too sensitive or we don't understand. Or they don't see color. Exactly. And I I think that's the worst thing somebody can say, because if you say you don't see color, then that means that you are just negating a big part of my life experience because I've had things that have happened to me because of my color. I've, uh, mm-hmm. I've had to make a, adjustments and, and, and adapt adaptations to certain situations in life because of my color. So if you say you don't see color, you're just erasing a big part of my life experience, a part of my uh, essence, a part of my, uh, process of, de- of decision making up through the years. So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't go for that when people say they don't see color. I hate that. And, uh, you know, that's why right now I've been using my Facebook actually to educate others because, you know, P- Norwegians close to me have said they don't see color. And I know they meant well, but yeah, that's the thing. You're, you're negate, completely negating my existence and experiences by saying. And I would say, go ahead and see color. There's nothing wrong with seeing color. See color, mm-hmm. but don't treat me different because of my color. You know? Mm-mm. So Mm-mm. That's, that's what I would say. Yeah. yeah, don't see color. I think that's that's a lazy way out. That's a lazy, yeah. lazy way out. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank you for coming on. I think, uh, I, as I said, I hope people can learn something from uh, from hearing your experiences. I hope so, too. Yeah. And I, I just, I feel for anyone who's gone through something like I've gone through. And, I, you know, I you're not alone. And I really hope things improve for all of us. Yeah, bringing when with raising awareness. Well, it's uh, it's it's very brave of you to come out and say these things because again, um, there's a lot of people who try to deny that these things happen, and saying these things happen, talking about these things that happen can, yeah, it can bring a certain amount of animosity uh, from people. So uh, I exactly. think there's, I think it takes a certain amount of bravery to talk about these things. But they need to be talked about. And to talk about it doesn't, we're not saying that all Norwegians are this, that, or the other. No, absolutely not. But what we are saying is that it is a significant problem and it should be dealt with. It should be spoken on. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yep, and you know the Black Lives Matter movement is is relevant here too. You know there there are Black lives here that you know need the attention drawn to them right now. Yeah, yeah. What do you say to the All Lives Matter people? Oh, that's hard because you know it's. I think there's this thing floating around Facebook, and it's like you know when. Um, what do the all lives matter people say to the black on black crime if they're not seeing, you know, or if they're not seeing, or that's, that's the people who don't see color, you know, and it's, and you know, the all lives matter thing is that, you know, we're not saying that all lives don't matter. It's just right now that the black lives, there's countless black people being slaughtered every day and we need to pay attention and we need to change and adapt and hold those accountable for those lives. I saw this thing on, I think it was on Twitter. Um, it was it was a fire truck, a picture of a fire truck heading to a house down the street that was burning, and yes, yeah, and then there was a house analogy. a house a little bit further down the road saying, yeah, well, what about my house? And then the fireman on the truck was saying, yeah, but this is the house that is burning. Yeah. So that's. And then a, there was another one with like you're you're at the March of Dimes, and people are saying elderly lives matter, uh, <laughs> cat lives matter. You know, you just exactly. Yeah. I think it's willful ignorance. I think it's willful animosity. I think it is people just trying to shout down the movement because they don't want to face the realities of racism in America. Um, I feel sorry for people that that uh, that come with that all lives matter crap and and, yeah. blue, and blue lives matter. Of course they do. Of course they do. But yeah, that is we not never said they but didn't. That, exactly. But that's not the issue. So mm -mm. yeah. Well, listen. Yeah. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. Go, uh, go hug your husband yeah, and your baby. Yeah, we need to get baby. back to that baby. I'm, I, it's hard. You know, I want to <laughs> com communicate effectively and, you know, get my point across in the right way. But at the same, same time, it's like, oh, my baby, the sleep <laughs> deprivation. Oh. No, I totally you know, understand. I, I totally understand. I feel like I can't form a proper sentence these days with uh, the amount of sleep I get. So I, I hope <sighs> I haven't made the issue worse. I hope I've only... Uh, brought some light uh, you certainly have and i thank you for doing that on my podcast well thank you so much for having me i really appreciate the opportunity anytime anytime all right everybody thanks for listening bye everybody i'm coming home oh, i'm coming home I'm coming yes home. i am yes i'm coming home I'm coming home, yes I am, my Lord, oh my Lord, Lord, I'm coming home.